we specialize in soccer markets. We provide player props, uh, outrights, uh, and, and major match markets through our various uh, pricing feeds. The approach that we take to derive that accuracy encompasses a number of different variables that a lot of basic models or some of the publicly available models uh, for prices and, um, and predictions wouldn't necessarily have. How well did your platform track the uh, collapse of Liverpool? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, we were actually sharing some uh, um, some simulation uh, predictions towards the end of the EPL season. Let's talk about like, AI and uh, because we have to, right? Uh, <laughs> it's required. You <laughs> can't. Yeah, we're waiting for that time to to pass us. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sports Betting Conversations. Today, we're joined by Mike Adams, co-founder at Keras. Uh, Mike, thank you for being on our show. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Great to be here today. Um, yeah, so I've been in the uh, the sports betting industry for almost 15 years now. Uh, started my career at Bet365, moved to Flutter, um, working in their Australian business, and then more latterly, uh, Fanjul, their, their US-facing brand. Uh, and during that time, it was all sports trading uh, and trading management roles. So uh, very much uh, pricing events, uh, managing the risk of, of events, uh, modeling different sports and uh, yeah, deriving prices for, for various different markets. So uh, yeah, that's kind of my personal history. And uh, over the past four years, I've uh, been running my own business in, in the form of uh, Keras. So we're a uh, what I would describe as a niche uh, supplier to uh, to the sports betting industry. So we specialize in soccer markets. We provide player props, uh, outrights, uh, and, and major match markets through our various uh, pricing feeds. And more recently, we've leveraged that uh, that modeling expertise and that uh, intellectual property to provide service to, to football clubs, so providing data, insights, consultancy. Uh, so we signed our uh, our first club clients this season, and we're looking to, to build on that uh, as we grow the business across that revenue stream as well. Excellent. And, you know, that's actually... Uh... You know, pretty pretty clever because you know your focus is data. You're collecting a lot of data, and um, you're leveraging that data for other revenue streams, uh, which is uh, you know quite interesting. Um, so, uh, in regards to Keras, we know there are a lot of companies out there that do similar things, but what makes you different? Yeah, so we're we're um quite uniquely placed for a couple of reasons. Firstly, our, our client base. So we provide to, to bookmakers and syndicates. So there's a um, uh, an accuracy, a validity, a robustness required in, in our prices that I mean they're market tested, market validated on a, on a daily, weekly basis. And if those prices aren't accurate enough or the trading isn't robust enough, then obviously we, we would lose those clients or be at risk of, of losing those clients. Um, the approach that we take to derive that accuracy encompasses a number of different variables that a lot of basic models or some of the publicly available models uh, for prices and, um, and predictions wouldn't necessarily have. So for uh, our predictions and prices for football markets, for example, there's a three, uh, three main elements if we were to, to break it down. So the first element would be what happens on the pitch, and, and we derive what we would term a, a fair score for every game. And that uh, accounts for things like um, yeah, the, the, the chances that we created, uh, the game state, like what, what was the score during the game at different intervals, uh, if there was any sendings off, uh, and who played in, in that game. Then we overlay that with the external variables that impact uh, performance. So how far have the teams travelled? Uh, is there any altitude affecting uh, where the game is being played? Is, is there a crowd? Uh, what was the schedule of the, of the teams coming into that game and how might that affect their fatigue or cumulative fatigue? So those are kind of the external variables. Uh, and then finally, we've got a, a bottom-up, what we would term a bottom-up player model. So instead of looking at what happened at a team level, we look at what the, the players did. And uh, that's one of our newer elements, and it's a more complex uh, model, a lot of machine learning going into that, given the you know, the, the dynamism of that uh, uh, 22 inputs um, to, to derive an accurate output. But um, yeah, so that they're the three kind of main factors, I suppose, within our, within our modeling. Out of personal curiosity, how, how well did your platform track the uh, collapse of Liverpool? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, yeah, we were actually sharing some uh, um, some simulation uh, predictions towards the end of the EPL season. So we always had Man City favourites, whereas the market kind of got them very close, uh, kind of six games or so uh, remaining. So I like to think we got a small edge over the market there with our uh, forecast of, of City. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, in, in, uh, Kevin, I think you want to yeah, make a says, comment. Yeah. I kind of love those lines on that. It, it's interesting on your differential, right? Because, you know, data art is in the business of building custom solutions, right? We really kind of get in the weeds with people to build something that's custom, just unique for them. And I'm thinking about the external uh, variable. Um, it seems like there may be some manual parts to that too, some real human, you know, research, or is that all in machine learning that you can pick up on all these, all these variables? Yeah, so so as much as possible, we, we've automated it and modeled. Okay. So using yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of historic games that you can use within within any data set to to come right. up with these um, answers, I suppose. So by isolating those various different factors, uh, applying kind of a coefficient to those factors, you know, altitude at 500 meters has a different effect than altitude at two and a half thousand meters. Right. So it's, it's that kind of um, a solution to to um, answering those those questions. There's a, a manual input to what questions we ask. So there's a requirement for contextual expertise where knowing the underlying sport, we have to hypothesize, does this have an impact that's going to influence price? Yes, no. And then go and do the necessary uh, analysis on that. Um, some of the variables that we have determined that, that have an impact uh, may still require a manual um, uh, flagging, for example, pitch condition. So a very bad pitch would have a negative impact on a goal expectancy. We would require one of our kind of qualitative analysts to have a look at the pitch in the last game, determine what the weather's been like since. You know, has it is it middle of winter? Is it summer? And is it likely to be a very bad pitch in this upcoming game? Um, wh whether we have automated, so we've got a weather API that comes into the model and updates hourly for the change in forecast because that has an influence on uh, goal expectancy. Um, so, yeah, wherever we can, we we've automated, but there are still some of those you know, uh, factors that require flagging that uh, we we struggle to automate. A, a feed for very bad pitches is hard to find. So, right. Yeah, that's great. I mean, yeah, you're really pulling in like every single element that's out there that could affect any prop or <laughs> any result, or a result of a, a game. So, yeah, it's re really impressive. Um, and in, in terms of, you know, the, the technology, like how, how did you go about designing your architecture, right? So what what were some of the uh, factors in play when you decided to go with what, whatever you're using for, um, your, your integration platform for um, your data warehouse. Um, yeah, if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so there's different elements to the technology that had to be considered right from the start. Um, because our primary client was uh, bookmakers consuming a price feed, obviously reducing latency is a key uh, key factor of that. So an architecture that scales uh, and, and isn't affected by you know, size or, or backlog slowing down uh, d delivery of odds or the change of odds, that was really important for us to get right. Um, and we've used some systems, you know, our CTO would be able to tell you in detail, but um, systems that actually allow for you know, the, the latency to be as low as possible, even if we're scaling across hundreds of thousands of price changes on a daily, weekly basis. Um, then on the other side of that, the, the, the modeling, we took an approach right from the start where we would uh, scale as much as possible across different leagues. So we, when we've selected data sources, where we've selected the, the modeling approach, it wasn't um, to isolate like the, the top five leagues or the top 10 leagues by you know, using a, a data source that didn't have the necessary breadth of, of coverage. So we've always had that in mind to allow us to scale the offering, scale the amount of leagues that we cover, scale the markets that we cover uh, geographically. So yeah, those two elements, um, considering those two elements at the start of the journey has allowed us, uh, allowed us to re um, you know, uh, progress in the, in the manner that we have. And, and did you have to adjust your strategy when you decided to, um, you know, leverage some of this data, you know, for uh, football clubs, or is that like the idea from the get go? Yeah, 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 definitely. 
uh, an adjustment uh, to make it fit for purpose that we're still going through. We, we've developed an API that's specific for club clients, and we're still in the development phase of a client-facing console for those clients. So actually to kind of segment the data that would be more applicable for clubs and, and deliver it in a, in a manner that's um, you know, applicable for users and stakeholders in that uh, in that element of the, uh, the business. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's talk about like AI and AI, because we have to, right? Uh, <laughs> it's required. <laughs> you can't yeah we're waiting for that time to to pass us <laughs> but um yeah i mean uh like what what have i guess how, how did you go about deciding how ai can help you and 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 get to the point where you can trust it because yeah it does some great things it does some things that are you know uh a little bit confusing uh, but uh, how did you go about to actually fine tune it so it will be a uh, um, so it, it will it would be a benefit to your business and not not a potential de detriment? Yeah, I think it comes down to controlling the features that you're using in any machine learning model or artificial intelligence led led model. Uh, we have a benefit with modeling sports that there is a. Uh, they're contained in a certain extent. You know, you know the rules. There are things that are static within different sports. But then there are nuances across sports that if you didn't uh, include it in features, then the potential to get very misleading outputs from any machine learning model is, is an ever-present. Uh, a great example would be cricket, right? The pitch in modeling cricket has a really uh, huge influence on the outcome of game and the performance performance within a game. So weather plus pitch, it's almost like a third team. But if you were to let a machine learning model loose on historic cricket data, essentially just looking at the teams and the players and what they did without including pitch, weather as, as a feature, you're going to get some very misleading results. So I think that for us has allowed us to, um, yeah, control um, the output in the direction that we want by managing those features. And without giving away any secrets, but this is, again, personal curiosity, um, you just mentioned historical data. How, how important is the, I don't know, data from the, you know, 1961 EPL season for, for today's market? Yeah, not at all, to be honest. <laughs> like, the, yeah. the, I think the... Yeah, the, the great thing about sports, like yeah, I've just said, there is a containment. There are things that we know, but there are things that are ever changing. R rule changes have a huge impact. So in uh, 1992, I believe, in soccer, they removed the back pass rule. So previously, defenders could pass back to the goalkeeper and the goalkeeper could pick his up. When they remove that rule, obviously, that's quite an attacking change. Defenders can't be as conservative as they used to be. So the average goals on a per game basis shot up in any leagues that were affected by that change. Um, they're, they're, yeah, so that's a, you know, that was a huge example of a, a significant change. But there's those kind of tweaks to rule changes all the time. We, we saw it this season. Um, a clamp down on time wasting in the EPL and some other major leagues had a big positive impact on goals because instead of 90 plus four minutes at the end of the game, you're seeing 90 plus 12 minutes at the end of the game. So almost an extra 10% of playing time yeah. and that has a knock on effect on goals. So, yeah, to answer your question, we wouldn't use a data set from 1961, but we would observe changes around rule changes historically and try to use those as maybe a lead or infer when another rule change happens, and you can yeah draw a, a parallel potential. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a potential use for AI. So let, let's say there's a, a new rule change coming into the next. You know, I keep picking on EPL because it's the only thing I really watch. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you can probably use AI to kind of predict some things based on you know the, the, whatever rules they change. I know they're looking at VAR, but uh, I don't know how significant that would be. Um, probably decrease some of the um, extra time. I'm assuming. Yeah, well, it's quite a uh, quite quite a heightened conversation. It will inflame lots <laughs> of emotions. The VAR discussion. So, uh, yeah, we'll hold hold our tongue on opinions. But um, yeah, you're exactly right. Any change that comes in, we would try and evaluate with a with a uh, educated forecast based on previous uh, examples of similar changes. Okay. You were you talking <clears throat> earlier about you know football and the UK and you know when you look at your company now <clears throat> in models 
Are you looking to the U.S., to the MLS, to the soccer? Your expertise is clearly in, in football and cricket now. Cricket is coming to the U.S., <laughs> and our pitches are going to be very different. They're going to be in Houston, and I think up in the, the Northwest, it's going to really change the game. Yeah, so are, have you started soccer. looking to expand your company to the U.S. following you know your expertise from the, U, from the U.K. in sports? Yeah, yeah, and, and certainly the MLS, I mean, 29 teams, it's, it's a fantastic league for the type of data and insights that we provide. There's different um, rules within the roster of, of MLS that make you know, the management of their playing squad and the different rules they're operating within. Efficiency is really important, how you use those uh, designated players uh, slots, how you utilize the foreign quota. I think there's eight or so players you're allowed before buying more foreign slots. So there are constraints that teams are operating within that mean you know, the efficiency of how they uh, operate becomes even more important. So, yeah, fantastically for us to apply our, our data and analytics. Right. And get interesting team. weather. <laughs> Some very interesting weather variables. Yeah, there. lots of travel, lots of uh, <laughs> lots of different uh, weather scenarios as well. Yeah. And some teams playing domes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Indoor <laughs> artificial pitches. Yeah. 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 That's great. Well, then, you, then you get a team like Miami who will throw all the data out of whack by yeah, buying yeah. up <laughs> players. <laughs> exactly. That. Well, I mean, it's a great example of uh, the importance of having lineups in a model. Messy in versus messy out. It's right, you know, right. three quarters of a goal difference to the to the team strength. So, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. And ticket sales. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, all right. Well, you know, this was all great. And, and typically like how we close out is, you know, we ask our guests like what the next, what they think that the next several years could bring, um, you know, to the sports betting market and more, more specifically you know, your area of the, of the industry. Um, so we'll love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I suppose the immediate, uh, horizon for sports betting, um, with the application of artificial intelligence towards personalization um, and localization, I think that's going to be a huge trend um, and a, an edge for operators to uh, to derive. You still, even though there is an element of personalization, someone logs on in one country, it's going to be different to another country, but to actually go really deep on that at a user level, uh, I, I think it's going to provide a great edge for the operators that get that right. Um, and then beyond that, I'm quite excited for when the hardware uh, catches up with uh, quantum computing and we can start to facilitate some real exponential uh, changes in, in modeling. But um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the personalization process. and localization, I mean, those are you know, some things that, um, you know, Kevin and I speak um, about all the time and like when is it coming, you know, and there yeah. are like, you know, you see little things here and there, but not to the level of like, Kevin, what do you equate it to, like the Spotify? Of, well, yeah, if you, yeah. <laughs> if you look at the Spotify models or the Netflix Q models and all that kind of stuff, you know, yeah. the, those industries are ahead. It's a little less exactly. complicated with regulations and all that kind of things. But but I think there is still going to be some tipping point moments with personalizations uh, with companies probably like yourself providing some of the back end. Yeah, yeah. The industry as a whole is just scratching the surface compared to yeah. other industries, like you said. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been great, Russell. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Mike. We appreciate yeah. it. Um, hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll uh, see you one day either here or or there. Um, <laughs> right. <We're laughs> <in> <laughs> great, yeah, great to chat with you guys. Uh, yeah, really, really good stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers, gents. Bye bye.